everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage (INTAC) and the INTAC Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, William Chapman, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohila, Director, ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker, William Chapman is the Dean of the School of Architecture at University of Hawaii at Manoa. Educated at Columbia, MS in Historic Preservation and at Oxford University, a DPhil in, in Anthropology. Chapman has worked extensively throughout the Pacific and Asia and has served as a visiting lecturer at numerous universities in Southeast Asia. He's a frequent contributor to UNESCO and ICOMOS projects, as well as serving as a reviewer for numerous World Heritage nominations. He's a member of the ICOMOS History and Theory Committee, the Historic Town Committee, and the Vernacular Architectural Committee. He has written on subjects ranging from the historic Volcano House Hotel in Hawaii to the Wright Brothers National Memorial at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. His latest publication is Ancient Sites of Southeast Asia, A Traveler's Guide Through History, Ruins, and Landscapes. Bangkok and Honolulu, River Books and University of Hawaii Press, published in 2018. A four-time Fulbright Scholar, Italy, Cambodia, and twice in Thailand, he received the Frank Haynes Award for Lifetime Contribution to Historic Preservation from the Historic Hawaii Foundation in 2011. Since 2016, he has been a fellow of the Explorers Club of New York. Chapman previously served as the chair of the Department of American Studies and as the director of the Graduate Certificate Program in Historic Preservation at UHF. The title for today's talk is Heritage of Ruins, the Ancient Sites of Southeast Asia and their Conservation. Southeast Asia possesses some of the world's most extraordinary architectural and artistic treasures. The countries that are part of this con cultural continuum are Indonesia, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, Malaysia, and Burma, renamed Myanmar in 1989. The treasures are the ruined remains of temples, palaces, cities, city, states, and empires, most dating from approximately the 7th century to the late 18th century of the Common Era. What are these buildings and sites? Who built them? Why are they ruins? These questions strike the average tourist to Southeast Asia. Who takes care of them now? Are there rules that guide their present repair? Whom do they serve today? These are the, perhaps the questions of the better informed visitor. There are broader issues as well. These issues will now be discussed in this talk. These questions and concerns also serve as the critical content of what many scholars now call a discourse of heritage in the region. Before I invite William Chapman, may I please request all of you to please mute your microphones. Type in your questions in the chat box. We'll be taking those right at the end of the talk. And also type in your name, organization name, and email ID. And I welcome you so much. Just to inform everyone, it's 1.30 at Hawaii in the morning and he's there giving the talk. Thank you so much for taking out this time. Over to you. Uh, Padma, thank you so much. It was such a lovely introduction. It was sort of a mouthful to hear all of my, uh, my past. Um, so thank you for inviting me. This is a, a great pleasure and 1.30 in the morning is fine. The air is cool now and uh, and uh, I live right on the right on the edge of the ocean and get a little breeze, so all is fine. So anyway, this this project began with a um, a research assignment from the Getty Conservation Institute in Los Angeles, and they were about to do some work in Southeast Asia, and they needed to know something they said about what kind of work they should focus on. And I'd been going to. I would worked in Cambodia since the early 90s when they were first opening up the Angkor National Park. And I thought this would be a wonderful opportunity to both look there and places I hadn't been before. So it had, I had a chance to visit Myanmar before it became really heavily populated by tourists and a number of sites and other and Vietnam and other places. So I felt very lucky to be funded to do exactly what I would do if I was a wealthy tourist, so it was a terrific thing to do. And uh, like I said, I've been a consultant already in Southeast Asia, so this gave me that opportunity. So let me go ahead to share screen here. And it turned out my uh, PowerPoint was just too big. Does that, Padma, does that fit the screen correctly? Yes, perfect. Okay. 
All right, so you're going to get a scrolling screen instead of a quick snap from slide to slide. And uh, this is actually the title of a book of mine. So this book came out a few years earlier, about five or six years ago. And uh, it's called The Heritage of Ruins. And again, I'm one, I was looking at the way, um, why, why were ruins important? Why do we so commonly associate ruins with Southeast Asia? And why, particularly five years ago, was it the seemingly the, the foundation for so much of tourism development in Southeast Asia? So let's see here. So this is this is probably the you know the money shot. Everybody remembers Angkor Wat, and this is the shot, as many tourists would say, and many scholars would object to that they populated with a village in uh, uh, the Angelina Jolie movie about Laura Croft and the and the Tomb Raiders. So, uh, but this is certainly the uh, the image that many people in the West have of Cambodia. So where does this all come from? And I thought I could start with a slide that shows a site in central India. And in a lot of ways, if you read the Jungle Book, which is really probably an important little feature in the back of the minds of almost every Western child. And um, it, uh, there is a very famous scene where Mowgli is taken to this ruined city uh, by the monkey king. And, and so I think, like I said, every kid has this kind of trope in their mind, the kind of discovery of a ruin in Southeast, in somewhere in Asia. Um, there are certainly ruins that stand out and people remember very much. And so this tour is actually gonna take you across about seven countries from places like Borobudur to the history of the sort of dis quote discovery or the revelation of ruins in Southeast Asia, which really takes place in the context of European colonialism. And it's the only way you can understand why these ruins became isolated as a kind of artifact type. So you get this sort of romance in all sorts of Western books. This is a, it was a really uh, sort of conservative writer, uh, young man, sort of young women's writer, who named G.A. Henty, who wrote a lot of books that kind of are kind of really typical of what we think of as the colonial experience where the young boy on the left goes, comes to um, what was then known as Burma and quickly is recognized for his, um, his leadership. And he's suddenly leading tons of people and they eventually hide out in a ruin where they're attacked by day coats, which are really really Burmese themselves, who were always identified by British colonial powers as, as thieves, which is the word that they used to describe them. So finally, a ruin is put into practical use here where they could fortify it. A lot of the ruins are really not that ancient. And there's a kind of another trope is that they're forgotten and ancient. But if you're looking in the back of Mingan, it was only built in the late 18th century, failed in its corner by the early 19th century. And this photo was taken around 7, 1880, around 1880. So again, it was only maybe an 80 year old ruin at the time yet had this feeling of antiquity. Well, you know, a lot of the ways that these places were tied together had a, a great deal to do with um, scholarship in the region and particularly scholarship by the French. This is Georges Sedez. He was a very famous um, historian and uh, linguist and, and basic, and uh, he kind of put together this notion of the Indianized Southeast Asia. Um, there were certainly, we're gonna talk about Indian influence in Southeast Asia, which is particularly pertinent for all of you, but this was, uh, he, he had, he's the one who, who actually coined the phrase, the Indianized states of Southeast Asia. And he saw a kind of unity among them. And he mapped out the Srivijaya kingdom and a number of others, but he saw, again, the, these basically an indigenous land suddenly interrupted by the advent of Indian travelers and Indian and Indians, basically scholars and administrators passing on the knowledge of India to Southeast Asia. In a way it becomes, a, again, I keep using the word trope, but it is a trope, a kind of theme of that somehow Southeast Asia benefits from exterior involvement, that somehow the Indians 
helped kickstart Southeast Asia. And now the French were there to really put it into shape. So the ruins of Angkor were, of course, the real focus of French scholarship because they had been um, a, an important part of uh, um, French sort of expansion of empire in the late part of the 19th century. And, and really this sort of culture grabbing and territory grabbing went hand in hand. And so they, the French were able to portray themselves consistently as kind of the protectors of heritage. Now, the other kinds of sites, though, you have to remember, and this is the sort of conflict inherent in all of this. You know, the sites have a certain meaning for the outside world, and they have other sorts of meanings for people living within Southeast Asia. So a lot of sites that we might consider as romantic ruins of coming from outside are seen by people within these countries as continually sacred sites. And so again, who, who, who are, what is it being preserved for? So I wanted to really look at this whole complex of preserving ruins. And you'll look on the left, you'll see a wonderful piece of architecture from Angkor, it's the Bakuin, and uh, um, just a little fragment of it. And you can see within that, there's a concrete sort of structure that's holding it all up. And this was really the kind of aesthetic and the aim of the French to kind of capture a ruin in mid, in mid collapse in a way to kind of um, provide a still photograph of a process. On the right, you see one of the gates to Borobudur, and this was restored by the Dutch beginning around 1910. And here you see a different kind of philosophy, a more an aim to a more kind of completed monument. And so this sort of sets the two kind of themes of approach for conservation in the world. So then ruins in the modern world, when I first went to Angkor, you had to basically bribe soldiers to be able to go up and see any of these monuments. And there was not a single tourist on the site. And, and uh, we went down to the Rulos group for those of you who have been to Angkor and that was really forbidden territory. And again, there were tanks sort of there and a number of the monuments still had, uh, had um, gun emplacements on top. So um, it was a really interesting. And then when I began working on this as Angkor opened up in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, um, the, what happened was the population that was visiting the site was, was originally mainly Europeans and North Americans. And by the time I finished my book in 1913, 2013, there were was, was suddenly mainly Japanese, Koreans, and Chinese visiting the site. So this sort of trope, uh, once again, this sort of theme of Western discovery and the ruins and the jungle and all this sort of thing had somehow transferred to Asian peoples as much as to Western peoples. So this is Southeast Asia today. And not many of you are students and scholars and you're aware of these places. So, um, but I'm, you, there are really seven countries here that are part of this sort of Indianized Southeast Asia um, complex. Um, Philippines is, we don't really consider as part of that, but there are buildings in the Philippines that almost qualify some of the Baroque churches and things like that. So Indian precedents, it's, it's undeniable. I mean, a lot of Southeast Asian scholars now are pointing to the fact that this was really the result of indigenous efforts, indigenous ideas, but certainly there was a lot of transfer from India that, the nomenclature, the very notion of a kind of stupa or sacred mountain kind of image, it comes from India. So you get a building like Kat Mison, a really important sort of building. And then you get to the Bayon and Angkor, which is many people's favorite. And you go to a place like Mendut and near Borobudur, and they all have a certain commonality. You can kind of see the family resemblance. You go to some places like in Bali, which is still a Hindu, a Hindu uh, um, region, um, you get sites that are very much living. And one of the great um, in, um, Indonesian historians uh, once pointed out, she said, it's very hard to document the ancient sites of Bali because the people keep changing them all the time. So tourism is really a factor. And as you know, tourism has been a driving force for the, for the presentation of monuments in Southeast Asia. This happens to be a, 
picture at sunset on the at the height of the buck of the Bakang in in uh, in Angkor, where everybody seems to feel they have to all go and take a picture of the sunset. So I always thought it was much more beautiful within the within the monument itself than up, up on the other hill. But um, the World Monuments Fund and the governing organization, Opsara, have been working to develop a, a kind of tourism management for these sites. So um, most of these countries see these ancient sites as a kind of a beginning of a, a, a really a foothold for the tourism industry. So Cambodia, it begins with Angkor and then you start getting more and more tourists and that spawns all sorts of development in the historic old town. And then before you know it, you've got um, village sites to visit and golf courses to play at and shopping to do. And so in Laos with Luang Prabang, which is not really a ruined site, it's still a living site, they picture this being the kickstart for an entire urban development. So let's take a quick look at different countries and how the sort of history of the ruined conservation. So this is Indonesia. This is a, a a picnic by government officials, Dutch government officials sometime in the late 19th century. And you can see to go on the picnic those days, they needed more than a basket and a car. They had to bring a whole retinue of bears and things to take them out to see these, these ruins. This sort of sets really the theme for how things are done. So you, many of you know this, the, the sort of typical form is what's called the Chandi. And the uh, Chandi can be um, large or small, these are the ones at the Dieng Plateau, and they they really even in even as small smaller pieces of almost furniture size monuments, they have a kind of monumentality to them. Borobudur itself is really referred to as a chandi or a temple. Um, Indonesia is interesting because there was these were in fact no longer part of the everyday practice of religion in in places like Java. Java had become Islamicized in the 15th century and, and this had really changed the character of re, um, religion, worship, the carving of imagery. So for even though Javanese people knew where they were, so they weren't really discovered, but they weren't in any way living monuments. So this is what it looked like at the time in the early 19th century when Thomas Raffles was governor of Singapore and then, um, um, I mean, governor of, uh, of Dutch Indonesia during the Napoleonic Wars and they made a sort of one week trip out to see it. So Borobudur today is very different. You know, it's gone through a series of developments and restorations by both the Dutch government and then later by a, a major effort by UNESCO. And as you can see, it's now a kind of park-like experience where there's a turf lawn and uh, visitor parking and gateways and tourist stalls and things like that. Another site that gets less visitation just because it's not quite as convenient to go to is the important Hindu site, Pramanan, Pramanan which is located just a little to the north of Borobudur and built really around the same time in the early ninth century. Well, here you see the Dutch, they sort of embrace these sites and this is uh, um, Von Steen Kallenfels, the famous Dutch archaeologist who really helped develop some of the techniques that would be later used by the French in, in, in Cambodia. So here he is arriving at the site in his uh, carriage. So no, these the images are sort of strikingly colonial. So the first restoration took place between around 1900 and 1910. And this is a Dutch engineer named Van Erp who was involved in trying to straighten the place out. And so the Dutch always had that inclination to kind of straighten things out so they would function better. In the 1970s, there was a major restoration project done by UNESCO. They were just coming off their triumph in Egypt at Abu Sambal. And so this was a, a, a kind of to show that UNESCO could take on these enormous projects. And it's quite funny. I think the sort of, I think the total project cost was something like 2.3, million dollars US and you can't help but think of Austin Powers like one million dollars and you think nowadays you know in a place like Hawaii where we sell condos for 60 million dollars this seems a rather uh, modest uh, operation but at the time it represented a big investment in culture. It also kind of proved that UNESCO was not going to be able to be the savior of all monuments. 
So this is the work underway in the 70s. And once again, it was guided by, um, there were certainly Dutch, uh, I'm certainly Indonesians that had taken over the control of the agency that was doing this, the, the monuments organization, but um, they were still bringing in foreign expertise. So foreign expertise remained a kind of hallmark of that. On Promenon, there's been a lot more recent work and it continues to get work because of damage or earthquakes and things like that. They had a major earthquake in the early 2000s that caused considerable damage. Someone pointed out that the damage took place where um, European repairs had taken place. And so that was sort of a suggestion that maybe Europeans didn't have the right technique. But to tell you the truth, it's probably because those places were, th those sections were the ones that were most subject to damage and the more likely to collapse. And that's why they had been repaired before. So Cambodia is really the kind of real, um, the most sort of no known site for ruins in Southeast Asia, the one that comes to many people's minds. And of course, Angkor Wat is really stupendous. <clears throat> and if you've never been there, you really should get over there. Um, right now, I think you can enter Cambodia as, a, as an international tourist, but it's not easy. I think you have to deposit something like $6,000 to make sure your care isn't taken over by the Cambodian government. So this whole idea of the Temple Mountain goes back to sites of a much earlier period. This is Bakong. It's, a, it's really a ninth century site that... Um, um, was an attempt to create a, a sort of major temple complex south of what we now think of as Angkor. It was really the center of a, a political capital. This area that you see around the edge was once a moat, so they continue to have some common, common features. They also, much of the Bekong was changed again in the 15th century. So some of the things at the top are actually um, later, but you get an idea of this sort of Temple Mountain. Bekong would be really the first artificial Temple Mountain in Cambodia. So um, others occupied existing sites, but this was really early. Um, this, is a, this is in fact a Bekong where all the people were taking pictures shortly before. And this, this was, uh, um, this was built just before Angkor, and uh, it, um, it does in fact occupy a natural hillock where the, where the features added to it. So Angkor Wat, very important monument, very early 12th century. Um, very many things typical, many things atypical about it. The basic kind of symmetry and the, and the, the towers and things are very special version, uh, Cambodian rendition of Mount Meru and the sacred mountain that comes to, comes from Hindu mythology. And, and uh, but it was also um, unusual in that it's, its orientation is to the West and it seems to have been a, a kind of memorial, though not a tomb to its builder, Surya Varman II, who, um, um, may have had his own origins somewhere in what we now think of as Thailand, but he was um, a, a king in Angkor. When the French first came upon Angkor Wat, they thought it seemed to be it seemed to be the wrong period. They wanted it to be the kind of peak because they were bringing in another European set of ideas, which is that every every civilization has a rise, a sort of a pinnacle, and then a collapse. And then they wonderfully discovered later when Philip Stern, the art historian went and provided new, a new set of dating that it was right in the middle. So it fit all their needs and expectation. It's a writer named Michael Falser, who is a scholar from Germany. And he's just done this magisterial book of, I think it's 1400 pages, double columned with over 1400 illustrations. And I just had a chance to review it and feel very grateful that I got a copy of it. And he points out that this, this was so close to the expectations and, and ideals of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris for the scale, the symmetry and all of that, that they, the French just went crazy about this monument. And so that became the kind of important one for them. The Bayonne, is uh, again, there was a kind of wish to see this as symmetrical and following in these traditions, but it awkwardly is complicated because it has like 54 towers, more or less. And then some of the towers have four faces, some will actually have five or six, and, and it doesn't follow the sort of 
expectation of pure symmetry. Much of it would have been wood and some of that's missing. There would have been wood arcades and things like that. And this was a project that um, the Indian government, I mean, I'm sorry, the Japanese government has put a great deal of money and research into. So Henri Mouo has often been, was credited at the time as quote, the discoverer of Angkor. He was a, a Frenchman traveling with an English wife with an introduction from the Ge Royal Geographical Society. And he uh, actually published these early pictures of it, but there had been earlier publications that talked about Angkor Wat. And of course, as you all can imagine, it had never really been abandoned. It just was no longer a major temple because the population of Cambodia had shifted significantly to the south. So, but he helped bring international recognition to the site. Um, there's a picture of him. He actually traveled with his wife all the way up into Laos where he succumbed to malaria and died uh, before his his work could be published and she saw that it was published in a in a journal and then came out as a book and this kind of almost um, lit up the fire for excitement to go visit these sites shortly after in the in 1866 um, the imperialist Francis Gagné and um, began this expedition up the Mekong and they ended up spending about a week at Angkor they had um, philologists and artists and other people on the expedition and they quickly made sketches and did draw and, and uh, made plaster casts of some of the buildings and, and some of the relief on the buildings. And they were able to send it to Paris in time for the exposition of 1867. So within a year, they were already displaying these things in Paris. By the early 20th century, even before Cambodia was taken away from the Thai who had suzerainty over Northern part of Cambodia by that time, um, Angkor Wat was really the focus of a lot of French conservation effort. And one of the things they wanted to do right away is clear away all the sort of what they considered detritus, villages and people living around it. There's even a, a modern temple on the north side of the, temp, uh, of the site. So um, all these things they saw as a kind of obstruction to really understanding the, the pure ar artifact. Um, one site that's very popular now with tourists, Bante Sre, which simply is a modern Cambodian word that means the citadel of the women, and it actually had a very, very long um, Indian name before that. Um, it was um, pretty much in ruins in the early part of the 19th century, and early part of the 20th century, and the French, um, um, in, in the, um, the French, uh, um, in Southeast Asia began to investigate this. And Henri Parmentier was the big figure here and he had begun an what they called an archeological excavation, which was really more or less removing detritus and things or trees and things from the site. So around this time, a man that would become quite famous in the West, Andre Malraux and his wife were in their early twenties. And Andre had this great idea that he would go to the Bayonne, he even got maps and things from Henri Pimentier. And then they hired some local people to start taking away some of the sculpture. And he got caught by the colonial authorities who and that he later claimed he was, as often as the case, he was trying to protect these pieces for posterity, but he actually had a list of buyers back in Paris that were interested in owning parts of these. He spent some time in, um, under, quote, imprisonment in a luxury hotel before he finally was, cleared and uh, went back home and to become the Minister of Culture in France eventually. Angkor went through some hard times during the, the American War in Southeast Asia and the, uh, the, uh, they uh, ended up, um, much of the population that was still allowed to live in urban areas like Siem Reap, um, by the time the war ended, they were really in very bad condition and actually reoccupied Angkor Wat as a house, as a home for a while. Right after the war, there was a great deal of interest in restoration. And in fact, the archeological survey of India would be um, brought in to work on this. And maybe some of you may have been part of that. I don't know, but you may have known of it. There'd been really very little war damage other than the neglect that had been um, this one corner of um, Angkor Wat had been hit with an with a, uh, anti-tank rocket and that had caused some damage, but mostly it was occasional pot shots by sold board soldiers who would take 
shots at some of the sculpture and things like that, but not very much. So the, it was really heroic in, 18, in 1989 when the Indian Archaeological Survey came and supervised the cleaning at Angkor Wat. Um, it got uh, a lot of publicity in Western papers, including the New York Times who claimed that it was really being ruined. And there was a different aesthetic. The Cambodians wanted to put it all back together and make it look nice so tourists would come. But then, so there was uh, this effort to make it clean and new, um, which kind of points to differences in thought about what is aesthetically attractive or not. The trouble with bleaching is the sort of scrubbing that took place is somewhat damaging to surfaces, but also it's not, it's really not sustainable. You can't really retain that kind of look of pristineness because you have so many sort of plants and lichen and things that want to reclaim the surfaces. So in the 1990s, Cambodia became a kind of um, center of conservation activity in the world. A lot of major conservation organizations were working there. Ikram in Rome supervised several projects, Sophia University from Japan. Japan started a permanent mission to Cambodia where they put a lot of sort of foreign aid. Um, the project on the left was actually in, in the Rolos group and it's actually was a project funded by Germans and, and manned by Polish, uh, Polish uh, experts. But always it was kind of outside expertise being brought in to work on these sites. The Bapuan was the one that was taken on by the French themselves. So people from the Ecole Francaise d'Extreme Orient were very involved in the reconstruction of the Bapuan. Bapuan is really a complicated site because it, it actually never was successful as a monument in his own time. It collapsed almost immediately upon construction and uh, it was simply too steep and too large to be built. So the French actually ended up introducing an entirely new um, reinforced concrete substructure to, con to carry all the weight of the stone and everything. So modern people have a chance to see the monument in a way probably ancient people never would have. Um, one site project that I had friends working on was the, known as the German Opsera project. And Angkor Wat has about 1500 of these images of, of dancers. And uh, this was certainly a part of the religious life of these temples, which would have had, and we have, there are inscriptions that talk about how many people were at different temples. And, and in fact, uh, I think there were something like 1500 priests and uh, maybe 20,000 people working for the temple. So these were major kind of institutions in their own time. So the, it's kind of peculiar. Apsara is a funny word and you got to, we, there's a tendency in English to figure that Apsara is, single, sing, is a, single, a single dancing angel and, uh, um, and that Apsara with an S would be the plural, but actually in, 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 San, in the ancient Sanskrit, uh, Apsaras is singular and Apsarasa is plural, so, but nobody follows that. And they ended up naming the organization that manages Angkor Apsara and they kind of made the, the words of the institution of the organization match the, match the, uh, um, the spelling of the, this figure. So a lot, some sites like Top Rome, which actually Andre Malraux said, leave it alone, it's so beautiful as a ruin, are really wonderfully uh, um, received by tourism. And you'll go there and these little kids will take you around and they'll tell you, They'll take you to see the tree that looks like an elephant, which is actually sadly still there, the long dead. You can see that on the right. And they often mimic the train guards. And so again, that's part of the experience at Angkor. And, and uh, there's a friend and colleague of mine, Tim Winter, who's written a number of things about how objectionable he finds it that tourists seek out the site where Angelina Jolie was at this site. And they seem to be oblivious to the more profound history behind it, but that's the power of Hollywood, I guess. Vietnam, Mison is probably the major site. This is a Cham site, and this is the area that French archaeologists worked in first, and I wrote a paper about three years ago, two, two, two years ago, I guess, about the EFEO, the Ecole Francaise d'Extreme Orient, and, and how, in many ways, the work they did in 
on the CHOM site, which is less publicized, has, has more, um, uh, it was a kind of rehearsal for a lot of the work they would later do at Cambodia. So um, this is a French archeologist on site. And at first I thought, what a wonderful image, because it really shows how colonialism exploits people and everything. And the, you know, even have a servant holding the umbrella. But then as I looked at it, I noticed that actually the servant is shading themselves and the Frenchman is sitting there in the full sun. So it, it, it speaks to a whole bunch of ways of having to interpret the site. So Misson was badly damaged during the Vietnam War. It was bombed by Americans and an Italian organization working with UNESCO has done a great deal of work to bring it back. But earlier, when the first round of restorations took place in the 1980s, they actually had brought in Polish experts who were very well-intentioned, but used a lot of techniques that were ultimately damaging to the site. So the EFEO was a frankly colonial operation. There's Georges Cedez at the middle. I think there was only one native Vietnamese person that ever became a member of the EFEO. The rest were all clerks. So it was classic colonial operation. And so people came to there. Um, Henri Pimentier ended up creating this quite charming museum in Da Nang, the Cham Museum, which used to be called the Musée Henri Pimentier. And he sort of incorporated pieces of Cham decoration within the building. So it's a kind of interesting sort of art deco like mixed with Cham architecture building of the 1920s. Laos and Luang Prabang. Um, Luang, Laos does have ruins, but the great touristic site in, in Southeast Asia is Luang Prabang, in, in Laos rather. And I like to think of it as giving you a sense of what did, what did uh, ancient ruins look like before they became ruins. And so you can see here, this is a typical Lao Thai kind of telescoping roof of a, of a temple. And uh, you can see there are stone elements, but a lot of this is actually carved wood and gilded. So, so but there is this very important site at Wat Phu, and it's located in sort of south central Laos and uh, not much visited, not really near very many things. And this is almost like the mortuary temple of Queen Hatshepsut or something in that it incorporates it kind of incorporates natural features into, so this becomes the kind of stupa for the site. So you have these little dots are actually or part of a photogrammetric effort to make a record of this site. So this was a site that kind of, I kind of focused on when I wrote this project for the Getty and said, this would be a great study site. And they ended up doing a, a long workshop there, but not enough came out of that project to my mind. Thailand didn't have quite as good looking a sites as, uh, as um, um, Cambodia. It had these sites missing their big roofs and things, but the Thai actually embraced this notion of ruins as a kind of symbol of modernity. So the reigning king of the 19th century, Chulalongkorn, Rama V, actually saw that in order for Thai to be a, Thailand to be a modern country or Siam to be a modern country, they needed to sort of emulate European countries and start embracing ruins. So Ayutthaya was the, the um, tourists in late 19th century, Thailand would take boat trips up to Ayutthaya and the king actually built a kind of rest house for them there so they could get to see all of that. This is a photo taken just after the second world war by a British pilot when they occupied um, Thailand for the period immediately after the war. So. This is what it really looked like before they began doing some restorations. So Sukhothai would be the other big site in the north. Yeah, once this is done, I would say Sukhothai would be the other big site up in the north. And that was really developed actually quite late in the game. It was really developed only in the 1980s and 90s when it was finally completed, though the Thai themselves had identified it as something more. And at first, these were very exciting. So when these sites became popular in the 90s, they, they thought, um, and they were, of course, benefiting some from people not being able to go visit Cambodia. Um, to tell you the truth now, they really have a hard time fighting for market share of tourism. They're not quite as popular. This is a site that's conspicuously like a Khmer looking or a Cambodian looking temple called Wat Chai Watanaram in Ayutthaya that's been subject to a lot of work by the World Monuments Fund more recently. 
So presentation in Thailand actually tends to mimic gardening ideas or park-like ideas of late 19th century, early 20th century Europe. Um, right. So it's often they're done with displays of flowers and, and sort of formal plantings and things like that, that the Thai find quite attractive and they think that's the right setting for these sites. Thailand also happens to own a number of Khmer sites that are within their territory that were developed by the Khmer Empire in the, the, you know, in the what, really the Middle Ages. And one site you may have heard of, of course, straddles Thailand and Cambodia. It's in, Tha it's in Cambodian te territory. So it's called Prasat Preya Bihar. In Thailand, it's pr Prasat Hin Pimai. I mean, pr Prasat um, Hin Bihan. And so it's got a different name for the Thai, but it's all based on these earlier um, Sanskrit based words. So this could only be accessible actually from the Thai side because of the way the French border was drawn. And there was actually more in the early 20th, early 21st century, there was actually a kind of war over this site where people, poor people, uh, soldiers actually lost their lives. But the, that seems to have been settled down now to some degree. Thailand also puts efforts into living sites, like this is a very wonderful site called Wat Pratat Lampang, Lampang and Lu, Luang, and it's in Lampang. And here you see something of the way Thai sites are historically put together, not as a total unity like the Cambodian sites, but often as pieces, um, different elements relating to one another. So, Bagan in, in, in Myanmar is really an extraordinary site. Um, something like 11,000 stupas and monuments. It was closed to tourism for a long time. This slideshow was put together to emphasize um, colonialism. This is Lord Curzon, who many of you in India would know as the governor general of India at one point and his, and his wife who was heir to a big Chicago um, 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 department store fortune. And uh, here you can see a Burmese in this picture on the right, and he's wearing a kind of Oxford boater and, and a striped blazer. And so the British had this other idea, and actually Lord Curzon actually spoke about it. He said, we should leave these alone. So the British had this great sort of really reflective of British conservation practice to do minimal change and minimal efforts unlike the French who are much more robust in the way they approached it. Now in the period since that, when Burma you know, became Myanmar in the 19, late 1940s after the, after the Second World War, uh, the Burmese themselves felt that they needed to bring all these buildings back to a point of completeness. So there was a great deal of conjecture based on stylistic expectations and things. And so you get a lot of rebuilding and sometimes a lot of over restoration as well. So you see a lot of concrete being used on the site. You see both the Thai and the Burmese are very uncomfortable seeing incomplete Buddha images. They feel that almost inappropriate. So I know I, my wife is Thai and I, we went to a museum once and she said to the museum guard, why, why are all these statues don't have any heads? And the museum guard said, I don't know, but the foreigners seem to be okay with it. So it's again, something that's uncomfortable to people in Myanmar, Buddhists in Myanmar or in Thailand. And here you can see they're rebuilding this stuff. So rebuilding is really a big part of it. And so these two sort of Chede in front of you, Zede and Burmese um, are actually um, completely rebuilt on the, out of a sort of pile of dust. And they basically said this would be kind of fits the style. And they had a lot of money coming in from um, Koreans and then later Chinese who um, have helped, helped at that point to under, under, under uh, um, write the, um, the junta that ran Burma. And then this was a big something that was really people objected to and it was first put up as a new viewing tower where they could kind, kind of consolidate tourists and they would no longer climb monuments would, but would pay admission to go see this. Now the last country, because we're moving along here is uh, Malaysia. We don't really often think of it as being a very um, ruin um, dense area, but they did, there was uh, important Surajayan sites there and sites related to that very early period. 
this rather colorful man named Hor Horace Quaritch Wales and his wife Dorothy got permission from the Thai government to go into the south of Thai Thailand, parts of which would later become part of Malaysia to map ancient sites. So this is my one female in a pith helmet picture. And so there is a small park near Penang um, called uh, Lemba Bujang, and uh, they tried recently for UNESCO status and were kind of turned down. Turned down. They have uh, the British who were teaching at um, universities in Malaysia had a part in some of the early at restorations in the 1960s. So they had very little to go on. Then these are rather modest stupa. So let me just quickly turn to different the things I've hinted at in the course of this talk is that there are different approaches to conservation, most of them dating back to the time of colonial experience in all of these countries. So the French are really interested in this idea of presentation. So they uh, have this kind of aesthetic sense that they bring to themselves, these projects. So this is the terrace of the elephant. So the terrace, actually it's the terrace of the so-called leopard king based on a statue that was nearby. And they really disassembled the whole piece and rebuilt the substructure in concrete and laterite, this local stone that is really oxidized like a clay, a hardened clay, and then re re reassembled it like a big puzzle. Um, they, there's been work that kind of pushes the edge of this. This is Preco down in, in Rulos, and it's quite interesting. These are sandstone elements here, and this is brick, but the brick was badly deteriorated. And, and um, the organization that worked on this, the Royal Encore Foundation, tried to, with great subtlety, reintroduce bricks to return, re restore a kind of con uh, a sense of integrity to the site without making it look over restored. Brick is particularly hard to work with because it deteriorates. Management, of course, is something that people have been considering more. You can go to Angkor and visit a site with no other tourists. It's just all, tourists always seem to want to go to the same place, whether it's the Taj Mahal or the Eiffel Tower, but they will go to the same places. So. Um, commercialization seems to bother some cultures and not others. Uh, the Dutch quickly, uh, and the, I mean the Indonesians, not the Dutch themselves, the Indonesians quickly commercialized uh, Borobudur and they have a pageant there. And, the, and when I first started thinking about these monuments, I sort of thought, oh, that seems so horrible to commercialize these places, but it seems to have minimal impact on the sites themselves. It seems to be actually far more popular with local people. So local people will bring visitors to see these pageants and they've begun doing this more in Cambodia and Thailand as well. Encroaching development. So there's modern stuff going around. This is Prasat Hin Pimai in Thailand. And you can see the sort of modern city has grown up around this archeological park. Whereas at the time it began in the 1970s and 80s, there were just little wooden buildings around it. The local populations are affected. The idea of these as touristic sites is to provide income for people like this, but they often kind of miss getting in on a lot of that income. The other thing that's interesting in Cambodia is this is a picture I took in the early 90s. By this point, these really picturesque little wooden houses and ox carts have probably been the ox cart's probably been turned into a piece of garden furniture and the wood house has probably been replaced by a concrete building. And the family probably no longer has uh, travels by water buffalo, but probably travels by motorcycle or pickup truck. So this has had a big impact on Angkor. It, um, you know, Keiko, Keiko Miura, a Japanese scholar, estimated 80,000 people live within the confines of the enormous Angkor archaeological park. So local traditions, a number of projects, a good friend of mine, Simon Warwick, that worked on a project here where they were going to return an arm to the Shiva statue. And uh, um, this statue is actually, um, Tarich has an important sort of symbolic importance to Cambodian national identity. So this is a kind of national figure. This may well have been in the top tower of Angkor at one point. Um, the Shwedagon in, in Yangon, as it's called now, is a really fascinating, but you know, it's been so kind of fixed up, you, it's hard to read the antiquity there. 
Um, there's a marble floor, there's an elevator servicing it that's been frequently regilded. And this is this actually comes closest to the kind of bell ideal of uh, of many local people. I know, my wife, I know, likes to see things that are complete and gilded and perfect. She doesn't really have that notion of the beauty of of ruins as in part of as part of her imagination. So surprisingly, archaeology is kind of late to come to this. The French called all this archaeology, but there was very little digging archaeology. And some of the archaeology was kind of inspired by some of these early NASA flyover photographs. And here you can see these, literally see these streets within Angkor Wat. So at one point, Angkor Wat was not this big empty stone monument. It was populated by lots of other buildings and lots of other features. And there were actually recent, more recent archaeology has indicated that, um, that um, there were little squares with small stupa all through this site. So this was a much more complicated site than it looks like today. So training is still an important part. And uh, you know, the University of Hawaii was a really early in trying to train archaeologists to work in these sites. Um, there have been a lot of other training opportunities. The place has really matured. Some of the students I had in the 1990s are now running um, some of the monuments in Cambodia and have been the head of some of the museums there. So it's changed. There is a kind of universalism, I suppose, to ruins. This is a very famous picture from Mahat Mahatat in Sukhota in, in Ayutthaya. And uh, it's a Buddha image enveloped in a banyan tree. And everybody thinks this is wonderful. Thai people take pictures of it. So there's a kind of, I think, a kind of universal beauty to this notion of nature winning out over culture or something that seems to be something that um, we share now as a, as a, as a theme. So this is uh, my last slide. And this one I this is the, the Bakang, um, no, I'm sorry, Bakang down in uh, Rolos. And it's really interesting because it shows the sort of later pieces. It shows this building was actually worked on by a Cambodian organization and met with a lot of criticism from others. You often find that the in-country organizations are hesitant to take on these projects because they're going to be criticized by their colleagues and things. So that's, I think, one reason why so many foreign institutions were involved, other than the fact of being able to um, establish kind of approaches and protocols and things like that. So anyway, um, <clears throat> and here you can see it being worked on. And in the distance, you can actually see a living in um, Cambodian Buddhist temple that still um, has monks and people attached to it. So. Let's see if I can stop screen sharing. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. This is a wonderful That's it up. So thank you. <laughs> I wouldn't take that much time to run through it. So thank you. Uh, we do have a few questions. So with your permission, I'll be taking up those. Okay. Let's see. You're going to read them to me or am I just. Uh, I'll read them to you. Okay. Uh, okay. The first question is about bricks. You mentioned bricks. So the question is, do you see any evolution in the pattern of bricks used in these various sites, the ancient period? Uh, they, were, they were different from our bricks, of course. They, they tended to be kind of broader and wider and flat, sort of longer, flat, flatter. The, the component was different, um, so you do get some of the later monuments were using bricks that are more similar to Western monuments. So if you were to look at some of the 18th and 19th century buildings, a lot of technologies from the West had crept in by that point. And so you see sort of smaller Western looking bricks, but brick is a tough one because as you know, brick in Southeast Asia to survive well usually needs to be covered by a layer of stucco. And if it doesn't have that protective layer, it, they deteriorate quite quickly. And you probably are all aware of the issue has been very a long time in every country to get people to turn away from modern hydraulic cements to traditional mortars. And when you put these two things together, the, the sort of hard cements with the softer brick and the different um, qualities of permeability, you get it, it actually um, encourages or promotes or underwrites more deterioration. So 
And then nobody wants to see them all stuccoed over again because bricks have now become part of our sort of vocabulary of something that uh, probably derives from English thinking of the 19th century, the idea that materials could be honest, right? And the, mm. kind of the, the Rusk and Morris kind of traditions of material honesty, which were eventually embraced by modernism, right? But uh, most, I think most of these religious monuments didn't, weren't part of that. Um, what we would now think of as bakery, you know, putting gilding on everything to suggest it's gold and stuff like that was really <laughs> the normal practice, right? So most of these had protective coatings. So I hope that answers some of it. I don't, I don't know if anybody's done a study of evolution within these sites, but they certainly would be different, somewhat different from site to site. And I'm sure there's some change over time, but there tended to be a bigger, bigger, wider and deeper kind of brick that was used mostly in Southeast Asia. Thank you. The next question is, do the individual governments generally support the maintenance of these historic sites or are they privately funded or is it funded by this admission fees or grants received? Well, that's another good question. Originally, most of the money came from outside. So the um, Archaeological Survey of India donated time and personnel to work in Angkor. And then all these other agencies, the Japanese and others, put a great deal of money into Angkor. And then as, as in around the late 90s, when it was really the tourism apparatus of sites like Angkor was developed, they were able to take revenues from the gate receipts to go back into the project. So now I would say it's kind of shared. Oh. The Bakang the got money from the US government actually money that had been, been put aside for the trial of um, war criminals during the civil war in Cambodia. And by the time they finally got it all set up to do the trials, most of these people had died already and they didn't end up pursuing the trials. So they had several million dollars set aside. So that went to the World Monuments Fund and to Opsra to work on the Bakang. So it comes from a number of different sources, so. Thank you. Uh, are most of these sites under UNESCO or local government? Local um, UNESCO guidelines. UNESCO doesn't have an ownership interest in any site, as you know. That they the UNESCO has a program that dates back to 1972 and the World Monument. 1970. 1970 is the the World uh, the World Heritage Convention, and so you can have sites nominated to World Heritage. A lot of countries were eager to nominate sites to World Heritage because that put them sort of on the map and they could say World Heritage sites. So the World Heritage sites varied tremendously. Most of the, if you look at a map of the world, India has a great number, but I think this country with the most is actually France. So France jumped on this right away. It's kind of almost like a French concept. Certain sites in Britain, like Britain, like places like uh, Bell, uh, uh, Blenheim Palace is a World Heritage site. Um, uh, in America, we have Taos Pueblo, but we have a lot of natural sites on World Heritage, like Grand Canyon and things like that. So World Heritage really doesn't come with any funding. They will send delegations and they'll have people come to help and they'll show up and at the ceremony. But from then on, people are on their own. So this, I think this whole new like, critical tradition in heritage conservation has begun to look at heritage at the World Heritage with somewhat jaundiced eyes. Like, well, you know, what does it really mean? I know we have some big ancient temple sites in Hawaii and it's very, I can't even begin to get native Hawaiians interested in getting them listed in the World Heritage because they don't want any more tourists. So, <laughs> so that's part of it too. So I would say they're all owned by local places and a lot of them are on World Heritage list. So. Thank you. The next question is how has the pandemic in your uh, opinion, the lockdown affected these sites. Do you think the lack of tourism during this period would impact them? Very much. It's been very painful for the sites. It's dried up whole currents of revenue. People are like in a place like Angkor, the city of Siem Reap has just ended. It's And all these people that you saw in those little villages are basically unemployed and unlike a sort of advanced industrial states like America, there's actually been a 
suggestion that the bailouts in America and the funding provided for people unemployed has actually brought a level of the economy higher during the coronavirus because of the amount of money that's pouring into the economy for unemployment and things. And so, but these places don't have those safety nets. So they don't have funding like that. So it's had a devastating impact and a lot, particularly on foreign tourism. And that's the majority. I mean, a lot of Cambodians go to Angkor. They take wedding pictures there and things like that. And there's a great deal of pride. But I would say the number of Thai that go to their sites is quite small compared to the number of foreigners that go there. Thank you. So how do you look at the socio-political system that might influence artists in creating these monuments, a shift in it? The socio-political system of artists who created these monuments. Hmm. You mean in the, at the time they were created or at the time they're working on now? No, no, I, I think, think while they were created. Yeah, so, you know, it's quite interesting. We kind of look at these pieces of antiquity, like you look at a, a relief carving in Cambodia or something, and they seem so an antique and everything. But, you know, there's a couple of villages in Cambodia where they continue to produce sandstone um, mm -hmm. images things and you can see that the skill level is still there in a way it's not as if it's a lost completely lost set of skills and the skills are kind of reinvented too um, and uh, I remember when I was in Burma the first time in Myanmar they was going around and this um, young kid kept trying to sell me something I thought he made and I kept looking at it and then I finally realized he hadn't made it at all he just like knocked it off the wall and was trying to sell me an artifact that he'd taken away but, and then you actually separate it from that and actually look at this little Buddha head. And it was actually, in a way, almost comically crude piece of carving. It's really, it's in this totality that it seems mm -hmm. so impressive. So in Cambodia, they've actually tried to resuscitate local crafts a lot and to, that would relate to these temples. A lot of stuff we don't even know about. Most of them are probably painted. And so there's, there's remnants of paint all over them. So the whole presentation would have been quite startling to modern eyes. It would have seemed garish. And as you know, in India, you run into that a lot, oftentimes local. I sit on this committee for UNESCO where we look at prizes for Asia Pacific awards. And you often get community generated projects where they too want to bring the paint back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And office is not the original paint. It may be the paint of one generation that they remember. Mm -hmm. We have a statue in, of a, our first kink, a European style cat statue made in Italy of Kamehameha the first. And there was one that was made to go in the palace precinct area in Honolulu. And it got lost at sea back in the 1880s when it was made in 1878, really. And they, ended up doing another one and they brought it and they painted it, they preserved it as a bronze statue. The other one ended up being found and eventually put in a more rural community and they immediately painted it to look like a human being, like a mannequin in a way. And it just went through a major restoration and they decided to return to the mannequin look. So it actually looks quite comical in many ways with bright red lips and big eyes, white shining out at you. So that's an element of craftsmanship that we often don't think of. But even, even these stone sculptures, as in Greece and Rome, we now know yeah. they were painting theirs too. <laughs> <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Thank you. Uh, is Getty involved in any of these sites that you showed? This is a question. Is Getty still involved in this? They kind of shifted the work in Southeast Asia to looking at urbanistic sites. So. Um, a good friend of mine named Jeff Cody came on, and that was more his expertise. So they've been very involved with um, like um, Georgetown and Penang and Malacca and some of these colonial British sites and, and some of the sites. I would say almost every urbanistic site in Southeast Asia has some connection to something outside, right? They are all a response to global capitalism and that kind of thing and empires. And, um, the kind of cities like Angkor weren't really thriving at the time of European involvement in Southeast Asia. So even like Yangon is really a colonial city, but just like in, as you and I talked earlier about Mumbai, you know, mm. 
mean that the monuments weren't built by local people and that local people weren't investors in them or artisans for them and and that these are have great beauty in their own right i'm definitely old school preservation there's a whole bunch whole bunch of critical conservationists now and they kind of question the whole process of what we do but i just say i love old buildings i just like old buildings i like the experience of old buildings i like the feel of old buildings and and I don't want to intellectualize all that stuff all the time. And <laughs> so the next question is, is leading on from this commercialization near the sites. So what do you think? A negative effect on the ruins on these sites or um, you're OK with it? Does it have a positive effect? Well, I guess I still feel leery of commercializing the sites themselves. I know when they did the sound and light show at Angkor Wat and they charge admission to go in. I thought that seems in a way vulgar to me, but that's just the, that's just the kind of puritanism of anyone involved in heritage stuff. I think when I first went to Angkor, there was a one small Chinese restaurant and another little group that the conservators went to in town. So there were two choices. Do you want to go to the Chinese place or the Cambodian place? Now, if you go to Siem Reap, there's no end of fun restaurants and high-end restaurants and things like that. So I have to kind of, I'm kind of a populist as well. I have to say that this really benefits the population in ways that the monument itself can't. You know, they get to mm. at first maybe work in these sites, but it doesn't take long for them to become the the sous chef and then the chef or maybe the owner of a restaurant. And so I think it helps the local economy. So um, again, if I think Corona probably shows this, you know, now suddenly CM Reap is probably empty and most of the restaurants are out of business. And, uh, and yet <clears throat> I don't think it, it probably, those were located sufficiently far from the site, they're not really commercializing. Some sites you go to and you kind of wish for some commercialization. You can't find any place to eat or anything, you know, or, or stay. <laughs> uh, the next question, do you agree that European organizations were in any way responsible for also misplacing artifacts from Ang Angkor Wat um, Kumar Ruj period specifically, that's what the, the asking or involved in exchanging the artifacts to other countries. Yeah, I don't know what role EFEO played in like purloining artifacts. I think most of them were probably quite true to their monuments and you might have had some things being sold, sold on the side during the period of the EFEO. Periods of disruption often lead to um, mm -hmm. the theft artifacts and as you know it's the convention on the uh, on trafficking and antiquities of 1972 that kind of sets the watermark for when things are considered stolen or not we got a delegation from Honolulu's museum to Cambodia back in the early 2000s to return two heads one had been bought at a in, at a art dealer in Singapore and one had been had questionable provenance. And so you didn't know really where it had come from, but the guy that collected it was a um, local Chinese artist who did these wonderful kind of Lasco painting, looking horse paintings that look sort of Chinese, sort of like cave paintings. And he was very successful, but he collected Chimera antiquities and, and he probably got stuff that was being stolen during the civil war period and buying them in Thailand and stuff. So as you know, in the late nineties, there were some famous cases where there were whole caravans of artifacts being mm -hmm. removed from a number of remote sites that the Thai government was able to interrupt. So um, I, don't, I don't know that there's as much theft going on now as there would have been. There's probably a better catalog of what's there, but. When I was first there in the 90s, I would see suspicious looking um, um, businessmen from China and other places, and Thailand in particular, walking around with guards pointing at things. And it always had little books that said things that you would be able to purchase that were on the black market. So it was, I think that slowed down now, actually. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Uh, how does one ensure that the skills required to maintain these heritage sites are passed down to future generations? Well, I think that we're really working on the sites. And I think most of the, uh, in Cambodia and in, in Myanmar, between university courses and on-site training, I think this is probably being tackled, right? And, and uh, there's a lot of NGOs that do get involved in the training of artisans. So that ECROM has done a number of workshops in Myanmar to teach about traditional plasters and ways of preserving things and things like that. Part of it is though that, you know, the techniques do change and mm. sometimes organizations, you know this very well, like the Archaeological Survey of India is often accused of sticking to kind of older mm. methods of conservation in the light of newer technologies. So, yes. um, sometimes it has to do with the on way bureaucracies work and people move up in the organizations and the, the people that once would have been on the front line are now in the offices and then they don't get to keep up. So it's a constant vigilance is required to make sure that things are brought up to date. So bringing students to sites and things like that are important. Thank you. Um, can digital technology be of any use? What is your take on latest digital technology that can be used in preserving monuments or even? Well, no, there's a number of organizations. I think the, the uh, it's been huge advances in recording abilities, right? And mm -hmm. using LiDAR and things like that. That's transformed the way that these sites are recorded. It's an extraordinary um, advance. There's a, there's a company called SciArc, not to be confused with the architectural school SciArc, but it's spelled C-Y-A-R-C, A-R-K. And they developed LiDAR technology. They use it for industrial processes and stuff like that, but they have enough extra money to put money into conservation projects. So after the last earthquake in Myanmar, in Pagan, they went up and did recordation of a lot of monuments. So these are extraordinary. They record within you know, a millimeter and, uh, and they pr pr provide a really kind of perfect record of sites. So. We have a number of institutions in Hawaii with LIDAR, and I've worked with LIDAR before. It's a, you, gotta, it's, it's, you don't just kind of learn it. The people who do it usually do it with other kinds of sites. You know, you got to plot, you got to enter in all the data and plot it to create yeah. these kind of beautiful images. It's not instantaneous, yeah. but it, it may be eventually, so that it might be much easier. We had a, there was a really interesting technology that the National Park Service in the US subscribes to. And they basically, you just take a regular camera and just mm -hmm. walk around something and try to get as many pictures. You just take hundreds of pictures, they said. And if you can get an elevation picture, they do that and you send it to them and they have an algorithm that will then create a 3D model for yes. you. Of that yeah. thing. And once you have that, you can, you can reproduce it at any scale, including full scale if you wanted to. So we did some of this in Saipan to look at airplanes underwater and they, that had crashed during World War II and you could have a good vantage point because you were up above them in the water. Yeah. You could take pictures from every angle. So it's really kind of magical to see these emerge. So, so that technology is really advancing quickly. Thank you. Now, I think this is the last question. Thank you for your patience. This says, where can we read more on the restitution of artifacts to these sites? Are there any references? I have some in my book, if you, if you can ever find my book for sale yeah. or in your libraries. <laughs> okay. Stuff in there about trafficking. I think it's probably quite easy to get catch up to date. There's a lot of articles written and there's scads of professional journals now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think you simply yeah. go to like- Your, your book would be a starting point. And then your, that, that your, your university or institution subscribes to and go through That's scholarly right. articles. And then you could just use Google for the non-scholarly articles. So yeah. what is the title of your book? It was, can I just- Same as the, Exactly the same as this lecture. Ancient, this, this book is called The Heritage of Ruins, Heritage. the ancient sites of, of Southeast Asia and their conservation. So I had it in my introduction, so I'll just put it there for everyone. Hopefully, please buy the book and you'll get lots of references. <laughs>
There's a newer one called Ancient Sites of Southeast Asia, or Traveler's Guide. Oh, that, that I read, that's, yes. That's one you can, that's a scholarly kind of, it's a book for meant for the knowledgeable tourists, not the average tourists. And I, and I put yeah. a lot of work into that, finding every site and putting a little red dot on it. So there's some talk of working with a publisher. A friend of mine works with Facebook in Thailand. And he's been talking to a publisher about digitizing it, which would really be great to have a digital mm. version. So that would be fun. So, so thank you very much. I think those oh, are thank you, thank you so great much great. for your patience and for doing this talk. Oh, it's a great pleasure. I don't get to teach much now that I'm a dean. I just have to deal with I mean, you know, the accountant getting mad at this, the student specialist and having to deal with personnel issues and a faculty person who thinks they've been badly treated by one of the clerks or something. And that's what my life is all about now. I don't get to do this very often. So no, you're very thing. good. You're very good. <laughs> I think the presentation was absolutely flawless. Everybody enjoyed, especially the old photographs. They kind of bring out, as you said, certain romantic notions. So. Thank you so much for the talk. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, everybody. You're a great audience. Wonderful questions. Far better than my <laughs> usual ones. So thanks. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you so much. Okay. So bye-bye, everyone. Bye.